we're now going to explain the con side here of the Coase theorem, which I already gave a preview of in, at the end of the last video. I first want to discuss income effects. I think this is the clearest way, simplest way of showing that the Coase theorem result actually does not hold in general. Suppose you start out at QA. That is that, that the Constitution allows polluters to pollute. And the story we gave was that pollution victims suffering a very high marginal external cost would pay money to the firm to get the firm to reduce output. And yes, that's true as far as it goes. But let's say a bargain gets made and output goes down from Q to QA. I mean, from QA uh, down, to, uh, down, down to this level. Pollution victims have to pay for that. And that means that in the new situation, they have less income than they did before. Now, one can think of the marginal external cost curve as a type of demand curve. It's the demand for clean air. And clean air. And if consumers have now less money than they did before because they had to pay some money to the firm, then in general, they're going to demand, they're, they're going to have less ability to buy stuff, including clean air. The economists say that a good is normal if when people's income goes up, they buy more of it. And that means when your income goes down, you buy less of it. So let's assume that air is, is, a, is a normal good. Now, there are goods that aren't normal. Uh, ramen noodles might be one where if your income goes up, maybe you buy fewer ramen noodles. But let's suppose that that the demand for clean air is, is a normal good. So now that the, the, the pollution victim's income has fallen because they've paid money to the firm to reduce pollution, that affects their demand curve. And in particular, their demand f uh, for clean air goes down. Uh, now, we're not... What we're graphing on the horizontal axis is output, which is the opposite of clean air. So if the demand for clean air goes down, it's like the demand for output goes up, which means that the marginal cost curve, marginal external cost curve is going to shift. It shifts like this. I'll call it MEC1. Well, now you see the socially optimal point isn't Q star anymore it's this intersection. But think about a second round of bargaining where the contemplated move in output is over to here. Well, over to here, a MEC is still greater than MNPB, and so they should be able to make a deal and if they make a deal, again, with the pollution victims paying money to the firm to reduce output, the firm's going to reduce output. But again, that's going to have an effect of taking money out of the pockets of the pollution victims. And so the MEC curve is going to shift down again. Now, it's hard to say, in fact, with grass, it's impossible to say where this process is going to end up. But it certainly seems that a point roughly like this is more likely where the process is going to end. It's certainly not going to end at Q star. Now, what's happened is that the definition of what is socially optimal has changed because you're taking money away from pollution victims. But that is how neoclassical economics works. It's sensitive 
you know, the demand for clean air is sensitive to the income distribution, just like the demand for bread is sensitive to the income distribution. And so when pollution victims have less money, less income, then you get a dirtier, a dirtier environment. Now, how about the other kind of constitution where you start at, at zero? Well, contemplate the move from zero to QB. What's going to happen is that in order to entice the, in order, in, in order to get the pollution victims to allow the firm to produce, the firm's going to have to pay the money. The, so the firm pays them some money. Output goes from zero to QB, but now the pollution victims have more money than they did before. So then what you get is, I'll call it MEC3, you get the opposite kind of shift in the marginal external cost curve. The, this is the, it's actually a shift to the left, it's the demand for the polluting output falling, because now the pollution victims that don't like this output have more money. Um, suppose another bargain gets made. Well, then the MEC curve is going to shift even, even more. So again, it's not clear where this process ends up. You'd have to use algebra or maybe calculus to determine it. But, but it's probably going to end up. It's more likely to end up at a place like what I just circled than it is at Q star. It's not going to end up at Q star because MEC isn't at Q star anymore. I mean, see, it doesn't intersect them in PB at Q star anymore. Now, the famous conclusion of the Coase theorem was that regardless of the sort of constitution you had, you ended up with the same quantity of output. But that's clearly not true. If you have a constitution that gives the polluter the right to pollute, then you get a sort of outcome like, like this one here. In other words, here. And if you have a constitution that gives the pollution victims the right to clean air, then you have a kind of solution like this. Now, in some sense, this should not be surprising. If the pollution victims are the one with the property right, they are richer than otherwise. And you get a solution like this, which ends up being one that they prefer. It's a cleaner environment. If the pollution victims don't have any property rights, then they're more poor, and the, the socially optimal queue is over here, which is a dirtier environment. So we see now what we've seen several times before, uh, that the definition of Q star depends on the distribution of income. And the distribution of income changes in this bargaining process, so Q, so, so Q star is going to shift. So as long as you have what are called income effects, which means as long as when, when people's income change, their demand for clean air changes, and there's no reason to suspect that it wouldn't, certainly the demand for most things change when your income changes, uh, then the cost theorem is not true. Okay, so that's the first point. How about how about this bargaining cost point? So this is the point actually that that Ronald Coase was interested in. Let me uh, let me do some erasing. Coase wrote uh, an important paper early in his career, in in which he tried to ask. Why, in some, well, the modern economists will say that he, he asked the question, why do firms exist? Let me explain the motivation. When he was a young man, the Soviet <coughs> Union was fairly, uh, sorry, that's my dog. The, the Soviet Union was fairly new. And economists argue, Western economists argue the Soviet Union would uh, never work because central planning was too difficult. But Coase observed that in in the West, in in, uh, in free market economies, we have some really really big firms, and they don't use the price system to internally allocate commodities. They use central planning. So, 
is there really that much of a difference between the central planning that Microsoft does and the central planning that the Soviet Union did? So he he was interested in these uh, in these questions of 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 resource allocation within firms. And and the idea that um, I mean the reason you have firms is because it's easier to allocate resources within firms than it is to allocate resources across firms. I mean, Microsoft could, in principle, not have any computer programmers as employees, just have the computer programmers being employees of some consulting firm and make a contract with the consulting firm to use their services. But that would be really, really uh, awkward and, and difficult. So that's the reason why you have firms that have more than one person. In fact, you have firms that have thousands and thousands of people. Um, so Coase was, from the very earliest point in his career, he was interested in the difficulty of making bargains, making contracts. Now, making bargains, making contracts, well, that's what this Coase theorem example is all about, is making bargains. You know, you, you, you start out at QA, uh, with uh, with polluters having the property right. And the notion behind this Coase Theorem story is that y the pollution victims make a bargain with the polluter. But Coase was really interested in situations where making bargains was hard, that there were lots of, lots of bargaining costs. Indeed, and Coase was a professor at the University of Chicago Law School, not, not in the economics department. And... Many non-lawyers think that lawyers spend a lot of their time in court. Uh, some lawyers do, but most most lawyers don't. In fact, there are many lawyers that don't go to court at all. They are employed by corporations, either uh, directly or indirectly, to help the corporations negotiate with other corporations and sign contracts. And the reason why you have a you have many lawyers whose whole job is to do that is because bargaining and making contracts is not easy. So this notion, this, this Coase theorem notion that, that if you're at Q pi, MNPB is really low and MEC is really high and so they should be able to make a deal is a very naive notion. Yes, if there were no bargaining costs, they sh should be able to make a deal. In the real world, though, suppose you're trying to reduce air pollution in Salt Lake City. The number of pollution victims is a million. The number of people that cause pollution is, well, at least every single person who drives an automobile in Salt Lake Valley. So you're talking about several hundred thousand, including many of the people who are victims. Exactly how are you going to be able to bargain? How, how are these the, the victims and the polluters going to separately organize themselves and engage in a bargaining process? Even if you forget about the fact that some of the victims are also polluters. In fact, maybe almost all the victims are also polluters. Um, bargaining looks actually pretty hard. So Coase was actually interested in the in the converse of the Coase theorem. He thought it was obvious that these kind of bargains in the real world were going to be very hard or impossible to, 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 to make and therefore the result he was actually interested in was to say that when you do have bargaining costs then you don't get to Q star. You, you might be stuck at Q pi, or, or zero, depending on what the initial constitution is. Bargaining is just really costly, and it might not happen at all. So, so Coase thought that it was obvious that in the real world, bargaining is difficult, that these kinds of bargains between pollution victims and polluters would likely be impossible in most instances, and that therefore the allocation of property rights did matter. That if you gave the polluter the property right, you're going to end up at Q pi or close to it, and if you give the the 
the pollution victims the property right, then you're going to end up at zero or close to zero. And as I said, it was he he didn't uh, he didn't call this the Coast Theorem. It was it was another Nobel laureate, George Stigler, who decided to call it the Coast Theorem and decided to interpret it in this kind of way. I mean, in the in the kind of way that I said when I was in the pro video. Okay, um, another thing which which people are talking about now more than what what Coast did is strategic considerations. I, I, you could perhaps call these part of bargaining costs, but I like to think of them a little bit separately. Suppose you only have one polluter and, and one pollution victim, so you don't really have bargaining costs. It is possible for them to sit at a table together and discuss. Suppose you start a QPI so that the Constitution allows the polluter to do whatever they want. And suppose the pollution victim offers a payment of, let's say, here to to the polluter. Now, this would be uh, uh, this would be fine, and the polluter makes a lot more money accepting the pollution payment and reducing output than the polluter does at MNPB, which is pretty low. So, a naive theory of bargaining would say, yeah, the polluter says, okay, I'll take it. But if the polluter knows that this is going to be just the first bargain of quite a few, the first stage in multiple stages, the polluter might take advantage of the fact that the pollution victim doesn't know where the MNPB curve is to say, you know, I'm going to try to fool the pollution victims into thinking that the MNPB curve is in a place where it's really not. Uh, the The firm knows where the MNP curve is, but the firm might want to try to fool the pollution victim into thinking that the MNPB curve is way over here. In other words, pollution is and, and producing this output is much more profitable than it really is. Suppose then that the polluter decides to say no to this offer. The pollution victims, if they're naive enough, will think, oh, he said no? Well, I guess he said no because it wouldn't be profitable for him to say yes. Well, that must mean that his MNPB, that I didn't offer him enough money. His MNPB must be really high. And these naive pollution victims might be fooled into thinking that the MNPB is above this red line. Now, if they are so fooled, then they're going to make the firm a higher offer next time. There's no point in making the firm an offer below MNPB because the firm's not going to accept it. So... By taking advantage of this asymmetric information that the pollution victims don't know where the MNPB curve actually is, the firm is setting itself up for being able to get more money from the pollution victims. Now, you can say the same thing about pollution victims. The firm doesn't know where the MEC curve is. And maybe the pollution victims are going to try to convince the firm that MEC is actually way higher than it really is. Maybe that, that MEC is over here. If MEC is actually over here, then, um, okay, actually it has to go the other way, sorry. Um, the, the pollution victims are going to make the firm think that that MEC is over here. So the pollution victims are saying, you want us to pay to get you to reduce pollution? But actually, pollution doesn't hurt us very much. So we're not interested in paying very much. We'll, we'll pay you a little bit, but not a whole lot. Uh, again, so so um, 
Now the firm might demand a payment like the following. Deceleration. So suppose the firm demands a payment like this. That's below the true MEC curve, and so for, uh, pollution victims would actually be willing to pay that. But if pollution victims are trying to fool the firm into thinking that MEC is actually over here, the green line, then they better say no, that they're not going to pay this much money because that's above the fake MEC. So in this kind of way, each party is trying to fool the other one about MNPB and one about MEC and so in order to get an advantage in future rounds of bargaining these are strategic considerations and mean that the the agents are sophisticated they're using strategies they're thinking several steps ahead they're trying to fool the other party and you're not going to get to Q star or at least it's highly unlikely that to get to Q star once ag agents are sophisticated in this kind of way. Finally one quick thing about asymmetric information so here's output let's just call it Q Suppose that MEC is here, dollars per unit of output, and MNPB is here. Well, here MNPB is negative, so the firm's not making any profit on the margin, and the profit maximizing quantity is zero. MEC is really high, so Q star is equal to zero. This this industry ought to shut down. But suppose the firm tries to fool the victims into thinking that the MNPB curve is actually what I've labeled a false MNPB. And suppose the constitution gives the firms the right to pollute. So then the firms go to the victims and say, you know, our, our, MP, our MNPB is over here, so we're going to start polluting. You want to make a deal? If the pollution victims are fooled into believing the false MNPB, then they will pay the firm not to produce. And since MEC is higher than the false MNPB, the end result will be the same. You'll get to you'll get to zero, but the pollution victims will be paying the firm in order to get the firm to move from what the pollution victims think Q pi is all the way to zero. So in this kind of way, it, it, um, economists would say that the pollution victims don't know the type of the firm. The firm could either be the type that has this MNPB or the type that has this MNPB. And because the pollution victims can't distinguish the firm's type, they might be fooled into giving a lot of money for, to the firm for the firm doing what it would have done anyway, which is produce zero, which is to go to zero. Um, technically, and I won't ask you this in an example, but technically this is called adverse selection. Adverse selection comes from an information asymmetry where one agent doesn't know the type of the other agent. So for all these reasons, I don't find the Coase theorem compelling. The, the reason that historically most, let me call them, opponents of the Coase theorem have used is bargaining costs. Strategic considerations are newer. Income effects, which I think is the most, is the, certainly the simplest, and, and I think therefore uh, one of the most persuasive arguments against the Coase theorem is something that y you don't find a lot of discussion in, in the literature. I, I don't know why, and I've been uh, doing some work actually on uh, on some research on trying to uh, trying to make the the income effect argument clearer. What does this leave us? This this leaves us being skeptical of the Coase theorem. Um, 
just like Ronald Coase himself was. Um, now, I mean, the Coase theorem is a theorem. It says that if there are no income effects, if there are no bargaining costs, if there are no strategic considerations, so this isn't true, this isn't true, and this isn't true, then yes, it doesn't matter what kind of constitution you have, you'll end up at Q star. So we're not arguing about the truthfulness of the theorem because it's a theorem, it's true. What we're saying is that in the real world, there, there are income effects, there are bargaining costs, there are strategic considerations, and all you need is one of those things to, to say that, that the Coase theorem conclusion fails because its assumptions aren't satisfied in the real world. Where does that leave us? That leaves us having refuted the argument that you don't need government to fix pollution problems. The people like Stigler, who popularized the term Coase theorem, were trying to say, we don't need government. People can just fix pollution problems on their own. If you're suffering from pollution, you go talk to the polluter and you make a deal. Or if the, the laws give pollution victims the right to clean air and you want to pollute the air, you go to the pollution victims, you make a deal getting them to, to, to let you uh, pollute some. That, um, that hinges on all these assumptions not being, uh, uh, that hinges on all these unrealistic assumptions. And so we're going to not talk about this anymore. We're going to, going to essentially consider the Coase theorem refuted in the real world. And therefore, the question is going to be not whether or not we need government to fix pollution problems. We do need government to fix pollution problems. But how should government go about it? How should government go about regulating pollution? Okay, I'll stop here.